You're listening to Dodge Movie Podcast. Your hosts are Christy and Mike Dodge, the founders of Dodge Media Productions. We produce films and podcasts, so this is a podcast about films. Join them as they share their passion for filmmaking. Welcome back, everyone, to Dodge Movie Podcast, episode 19. And it just so happens I did not plan this. Maybe subconsciously I did. We're talking about a film, a little known film called Table 19. Take the win. I am. I am. When I wrote it out, I thought this is awesome. Okay. This is one of those movies why we put the podcast together because Mm -hmm. Mike found this film. He's a huge Anna Kendrick fan, as I am, but I feel like he seeks out things that she's in, which isn't hard. The little chipmunk, she's in a lot. So I just want to interject and say, I know the instant that I turned the corner and became one of Anna Kendrick's biggest fans and she was on Doug Loves Movies. Oh, I was going to say, duh, Pitch Perfect. Well, even before Pitch Perfect, I think, I'm not exactly sure, but I listened to her on Douglas movies and I said, I like the cut of her jib. She's a cool chick. I like Mm -hmm. her too. So Mike found this movie, like I said, a little movie. I never really heard about it. I think Mm -hmm. he said, hey, I heard about this little movie. Let's check it out. So it was a 2017. It's Anna Kendrick, Lisa Kudrow, Craig Robinson, Margot Martindale, who you you guys would know if you saw her, and Stephen Merchant. Margot is only by voice. She's always off screen. Are you sure? I thought she was in one. Okay, maybe my notes are wrong, but according to my notes, she's she's always on the phone. Oh, okay. So the director is Jeffrey Blitz, and I had never heard his name before, but I looked him up, and he wrote on The Office from 2007 to 2010, which kind of now makes sense how he got Craig Robinson, and he worked with Stephen Merchant on that on the office. But one of our pause counts was Q gasp because <gasps> as we were watching the movie, Mike pauses and gasps and says, "Guess who the writers are?" And it's our patron saints, the Duplass brothers. The Duplass brothers. How did we not know the first time that this was a Duplass movie? I don't know. I am embarrassed that I didn't know and I'm sorry Jay and Mark that I did not know. Our massive apologies to Plast Brothers because we do adore you. Please don't hold it against us. Please. But that makes sense why we love this movie. Yes, I think you can see their, I mean, they, I believe, have a story credit. You can see, I think, in the construction of the story, you can see their hand, right? Well, it takes place in one day. Right. Locations are primarily this resort. Right. It's character driven. Very character we driven. See, over time, there's progressive disclosure of some fairly serious activity. That has gone in the past for these characters. It's awesome. It's all right there. It's all right right there. there. So let me tell you the synopsis of this film. Eloise, who Anna Kendrick plays, having been relieved of her maid of honor duties after being unceremoniously dumped by the best man via text, decides to attend the wedding anyway, only to find herself seated with five fellow unwanted guests at the dreaded table 19. And the tagline for this film is, don't fit in, take a number. So the tagline kind of for table 19 in the wedding is the table that should have known to RSVP with regrets. <laughs> so I will say that I have attended a wedding in which there was a table that was placed obviously in a position of inferiority over to the side and behind plants. It was kind of comic. I don't know if it was the 19th table, but it could have been when you count them all up. So I kind of have actually seen this go down in real life yeah craig i think during the film says when you can see the kitchen and you can smell the bathroom you know you're not at a good table yeah (laughs) and so there's a point in which one of the characters says i think it's in a toast look no further than table one and i made the note that i don't know at a wedding that they've been numbered or that people talk about them by number but when you're title of your film is table 19 i think it makes sense yeah i don't want to get ahead of ourselves i want to speak to the tables but mike what's the pickup line what's the first line of the film shit (laughs) it's whispered by anna kendrick if i remember correctly yeah that's a great scene because she's trying to decide how to respond to the rsvp card yes and i really enjoyed that she went to light it on fire and then changed her mind (laughs) 
and then mailed it in yeah. with the corner Singed. burnt away. Yeah. yeah. That's that's great. So you were talking about the tables and there is a great scene because Anna Kendrick was slated to be the maid of honor. She's very intimately aware of all the table assignments. Right. And there is a, I would love to have timed it. There's a super fast scene where she goes through tables one through 18 explaining basically the theme of each of those tables and who is there in rapid fire it's a great scene and it's great exposition what a clever way to get that exposition in yes it lets us know who are the important people why were they invited why are they at that table and why are we all here more importantly so this says a little bit about me as a person maybe or me as a viewer but i absolutely adore the premise of six strangers put in kind of so like a bottle app right they're physically put together they have nothing in common and we're going to slowly reveal each of these characters over time so as a writer i really respect how that was done because we get to see each of the characters and it makes a seamless tapestry as we go through the film yeah and i'm going to interject here because i know some of our listeners we use a lot of hollywood lingo and moro would say (laughs) <laughs> we're, we're some of those movie douchebags that use all the lingo, but it's fun. Hi, Dustin. But a bottle ep is based on I Dream of Genie when they would have an episode where it would all take place inside Genie's bottle. And every once in a while they would do that. And I'm forgetting. It's production. Is that. It just saves time and money. Yeah. Fewer number of sets. And sometimes you can get away with not even having some actors in yeah, that episode. That's so right. So it's just to save time and money. You'll do this. So I think probably the height of this is, you know, some weird auteur that writes a film about people being stuck in an elevator. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> So that's where that phrase comes from. And it's very similar. I wrote down partway through this reminded me of like the Breakfast Club kind of because you had these was a six, seven people and they're all, you know, stuck in the library and they're all in the same circumstances. And this film reminded me of it. And later there's a montage where they're all dancing and Stephen Merchant Mm -hmm. and I wrote down Razzo. Renzo is the character's name. I don't remember the actor's name so well. Oh, yeah. He's kind of like the dorky guy. And they're doing the Emilio Estevez. Mm -hmm. In the balcony in the library. Yeah. Marching dance. And so I thought, oh, I know they did that on purpose. That's not an accident that they said, oh, we'll just dance like these guys. I just I think this movie very much is reminiscent of that Breakfast Club feel. Again, they trapped six characters for a time period in a physically constraining situation. Yeah, because what we left out is basically the people at this table band together to help Anna Kendrick kind of get back with her boyfriend. Yeah, at first we're not really sure what we're helping Anna with. And this is, again, what the genius, I think, of the writing of this film is we mentioned there's that scene where she lists off all the tables because she was supposed to be the maid of honor. And we now have this question as the audience, if she's that important why is she back here at table 19 with all the losers right that's obviously a narrative question how are we going to resolve this and pretty early on we have an interaction with the bride's brother teddy her ex and i'll be honest he got a little of the test action there he was not the most favorable or sympathetic character at the first part of the film right what are some of your other notes about the writing so the inciting incident is teddy tells eloise to not make a scene. Eloise has this recurring pattern of going too far, and she talks about it out loud, explicitly, later in the film. That's kind of her arc, is to not overreact. But then as the film goes on, we see that she did not overreact with Teddy, that her reaction was completely normal, and he kind of freaked out. And at the midpoint, we discover that she was pregnant, and that was their falling out was about that. And there's this deliciously awkward confrontation in kind of the foyer at this wedding venue where there's actually more than one wedding going on, right? Just imagine having that conversation in front of strangers in the foyer of this building at your sister's wedding, right? Such a deliciously awkward and uncomfortable situation, which I, actually I think these Duplass brothers are good at mining that for a dramatic effect. I think they love awkward. Yeah. Keeping helping of awkward and icky. Yeah. You pointed out that there's exposition that tells us that the couple met in a karaoke bar. And so they have the band play a lot of 80s covers, which 
you said would be great because then it almost infuses the wedding as well as the soundtrack of the film with these reminiscent kind of 80s songs which I think now I'm trying to remember what song they were doing like the breakfast club dance to it was at the same one from the film there's a Cindy Lauper song time after time or I think it was one of her her more famous songs that they have kind of a, a dance number two. And what I noticed, because this is w- one of my either special powers or obsessions, is there's an extra pulling a full favro on the side of the crowd. <laughs> She's in a silver dress, and I could not help but watch her in the scene. It was great. She was really giving it her all. But yeah, because it's a cover, you don't have to pay quite as much right? It's cheaper. And I'm guessing that the filmmakers are probably of the age that we are. And that's the kind of music we grew up on and we enjoy. So it's a great way to get it in your film. Yeah. So many of these films have been criticized in the past for having magical characters, right? So the legend of Bagger Vance, right? Will Smith is this magical character. Well, here, the nanny is kind of the magical character. And I love the performance by June Squibb, who's the actress, as this nanny character who we come to find out has not just some really cool lines, but there's a lot going on with that character. But one of my favorite lines that she had was terrible parents were my bread and butter. (laughs) And I thought that was, that was a really funny line. Yeah. She was a great character. Like you said, she was kind of like the heart of the film. Mm -hmm. And later when, after some comedy hijinks ensue and the film kind of starts to slow down a little bit and they go outside to the lake, by the way, beautiful cinematography when they go outside. They film this in Atlanta at some resort, which for those of you, Atlanta is getting to be, or isn't getting to be, it is a big hub. It's kind of like Hollywood East because Georgia has offered a lot of kickbacks and tax relief to the filmmakers. So Atlanta is a pretty big filmmaking area. And I realized a film like this, it doesn't, it could really be made anywhere because it's mostly indoors at this resort where they have the wedding. But when they go outside to kind of take a hike and kind of get them, I guess, just away from the wedding, it's just, you know, it's like golden hour. It's beautiful. And I have to say shout out to my buddy Chris, who's from the Atlanta area. So if we ever end up filming there, we'll bring him along as a fixer. So this nanny character serves the valuable role of helping propel the story forward because she's the only one that seems to perceive what's really going on with the character of Eloise. And she says, never doubt a nanny's intuition. You see her inserting herself at key points and she calls it like it is. And one of the reasons I like the character is because she has zero care abouts when it comes to other people's feelings. And we find out later why that might be. But that was important to get the characters to start talking. Well, and she's a great tool early on in the film because as people start sitting down at the table, she does what we all do at a wedding when we don't know a lot of people, especially the people at our table. Like, how do you know the couple? Are you with the bride or the groom? And so that allows for exposition for us to get to know how people are connected, why they were invited to this wedding, and also informing why this is kind of the oddball table. What I also liked about that character is she is not originally treated very well. And there's a scene which is really kind of heartbreaking where it turns out that she was not invited out of love. And to show that an older character, which of course is hitting a little close to home as I age myself, is not an idiot, right? She understands what's going on and it hurts her, but she can get through it, right? She's tougher than just that little thing. But I I really thought that was a deliciously meaty role for an actor who is of an older age. No, it's a really, it's like you said, it's a heartbreaking scene. And it's almost like she was so excited to be included. I think, you know, I can kind of speak to this too. We want to feel that we were important in people's lives. And so I think it probably tickled her to get the invitation and to know that so many years later that this person wanted them to be there on their special day and then to find out that that maybe wasn't the case. It is a heartbreaking scene. She also has a point in the film where she has a pretty negative perspective on Teddy for a specific incident or she uses a specific incident as justification for that, and then it turns out that she's wrong. Mm -hmm. And I like that writing, too, to show that she wasn't infallible, even though she was the magical nanny. I think these Duplass kids are going to go someplace because they do write good stuff. I think 
one of these days, if I ever get to meet them, uh, I'm going to squee. We will embarrass I'll ourselves. Probably, yeah, <laughs> I, I'll probably tear up and I won't be able to speak. And then Mark will go on Instagram and talk about this <laughs> weird guy, ball guy he encountered. That just, yeah, but this is just really, and, really and, good. and not just the Duplass brothers, I mean the whole cast and crew. It is. This is that such was a good of, film. I'm sorry to interrupt you. That was one of our pauses was just to talk about the amazing cast in this film. That's why it's so sad when little films like this don't get their due because not only is there fabulous acting, but there's great writing, wonderful cinematography, and it's got all the feels. Like it's funny and it has poignant moments and You know, it kind of tugs at your heart, but not in a saccharine way. I mean, it's just, it's very well balanced. So watching this film again, it may be my Blue Jay. (gasps) For those of you who listened to episode two, you know what he's talking about. Oh my gosh. I didn't know. You didn't tell me that before. That makes me so excited. I didn't realize it until we watched it again. And it was like, oh my gosh, this is. Such a good film. This checks all of the boxes for me. This is like they set out to make a film that I would love. Yes. Right? It's got weddings. It's got humor. It's got twists. It's character driven. You've got great acting. You've got people acting out of type, right? So not to just select two actors, but Craig Robinson and uh, I'm going up on Lisa Lisa Kudrow, right? Craig Robinson and Lisa Kudrow, they play this married couple, but neither one of them is playing a role that they're really known for. Yeah. So there's such a touching scene at the end of the film between the two of them in the shower, which by the way, getting Craig and Lisa to take their clothes off is good for ratings, but it was done, I think, in a sweet and tender way. Not that they're not attractive when they're naked, but it's more about them being emotional, which is, again, these are two characters or two actors, I'm sorry, who are known for being funny. And to see that acting range for them is really just fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a great movie. It really is. It, Like you said, as we talk about it, watching it the second time and then as we talk about it, I just realize what, you know, like you said, it checks all the boxes. It's a great, great film. So does this one have a driving? You said no. This one doesn't have a driving. This right? has no motor vehicles in it whatsoever. I suppose that's the only knock you could say against this film. <laughs> well, there is a cart that drives a cake around. Could we? Uh, I, I, w- I have the cake here under head trauma. So right. there is no head trauma. But sadly, Mike, oh. this could cause some trauma for you. A cake takes a pretty oh, bad yeah. beating. Yeah, it does. I think Being the patron saint of cakes. A wedding cake in particular. Yeah. yeah. There's a cake that gives its life for the making of this film. Not only does it give its life, but I have a note here that according to Anna Kendrick, the cake knock over aftermath had to be filmed before the actual knocking over of the cake to ensure that they got enough of the cake on them. <laughs> And that's for the sight gag. Yeah. We had only one pause count, and that was, like we referenced before, for Mike to tell me that it was a Duplass movie. I did not make note of the smoochies, but there had to be one. Smoochie, smoochie, smoochie. Okay, I'm going to check my notes. I got a smoochie, smoochie, smoochie at 3640 when Eloise kisses Huck, and at an hour 19 when she kisses Teddy again. Of course. I will say, in speaking of Doug Love's movies, not for a metaphobe section, is Eloise vomits into her napkin at 39 minutes into the film. Also miscellaneous trivia, Oregonian spotting. Maria Thayer of Boring, Oregon, plays the infamous Kate Milner. Is it Maria or Marina? Uh, I have Maria Thayer in my notes. Okay. Of Boring, Oregon. Right. If I recall correctly, I know she's an Oregonian. Pretty sure she's from Boring. I added that to my Northwest connection. Shall we do the numbers? Sure. So this movie cost them $5 million to make. It only made 3.6 domestic and 1.4 international. So they netted $42,000. Well, I didn't see this in the theater. I don't think it got much. I don't think it released. Yeah. So I actually think they may have done okay on the back end through Netflix or... Right. Amazon, whoever they went through. Right. Because I, this is a film that I would have seen, a wedding comedy with Anna oh, Kendrick. Oh, if this was in theaters, we would have been there. Yeah. Day one. Yep. 
It did not rate very good on IMDb. It was only... What? F- I know. I know. They're they're fools. 5.8 on IMDb. I looked up Rotten Tomatoes to kind of check that. Rotten Tomatoes had it at 25% and the audience only rated it at 41. So like they rated it rotten, which I don't understand. You guys... Did you they have- see the film? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. It's only an hour and a half commitment. It's PG-13, so you can even watch it with your teenagers. Like I said, there's comedy and romance. You guys, give this one a look and let us know if we are smoking crack thinking that this is such a great movie. Okay. I will be nice, but I want you to contact me if you don't think this is a good film, because I want to know why. Okay. So here's our phone number, 971-245-4148. If you do not like Table 19, call us and tell us why, because we're really curious. Like, we're not going to throw down. We just are really curious how this doesn't hit right. the mark. And of course, if you do like the film, then you can also call us or, <laughs> or send us an email or a tweet or whatever. Yeah. Because obviously we'd have a little bit more to talk about, but I am curious how a person could not just love this film. This is such a good film. And and I have to say not to be a fanboy or anything, but anybody who worked on the film, like go ahead and reach out to, because I'll give you some love. (laughs) I'm totally not kidding. I think this is such a fantastic film. I think everybody should be proud. This to me is just for $5 million. What a fantastic. Yeah. It's a good example of, of like indie filmmaking. And like you said, what a talented cast and crew, because I can't remember if I looked up if Jeffrey did anything else other than I'm sure he did, but I just didn't make note of it. Mm -hmm. But what a talented cast and crew. I mean, when you know, we're totally fanning out. But when you have writers of Mark and Jay, Mm -hmm. you have a director that is familiar with comedy from The Office, Mm -hmm. and then you have that cast. I don't understand how this didn't get purchased as part of you know, a distribution plan. Right. I just, I don't get it. And there's Stephen Merchant humor in this film. He's really funny. Yeah. He's an established. So if you're just looking for the laughs, right, we've got established comedians being funny. We've got established comedians being dramatic. We've got good writing. We've got clever plot twists. I have seen the film and I still got surprised by the twist at the end of act two, right? Imagine that of all things. So again, like I could, I could live with a seven rating, but come on, guys. Yeah. Well, and people could go rate it and bump it up there a little bit. But more uh, appreciated would be if you would go and rate us and review us and give us some love. Tell us what you think. Send us an email at christy at dodgemediaproductions.com. Let us know what movies you want to see. This one, I believe, is rounding out our month of wedding movies. So we will be moving into musicals. I, for one, am so excited. I have been waiting a whole year for them to release In the Heights by Lin-Manuel Miranda, and it is coming out June 11th on HBO Max, and I am counting the days. That is one of the films we're doing in the month of musicals in July, so stay tuned if you love musicals, and if you don't, you will learn to love them because you will hear how much we love them. And a little foreshadowing in the month of musicals, we will return to Anna Kendrick. That's right. That's right. I swear, I think we could do a whole Anna Kendrick month, probably. Even yeah, we probably taking could. out the two that we're we're already. Maybe once we've recorded all four, we'll package up just one long two hour one and send it to her. Like Aww. here you go. All right. Well, we could do that with the Duplasses too. Oh yeah. Although the restraining order might get in the way. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> I'm just kidding about that. Mark and Jay, don't do that. Mark and Jay, we're really harmless. (laughs) All right, everybody, don't forget. Dodges never stop and neither do the movies. Thanks for listening to Dodge Movie Podcast with Christy and Mike Dodge of Dodge Media Productions. To find out more about this podcast and what we do, go to dodgemediaproductions.com. Subscribe, share, leave a comment, and tell us what we should watch next. Dodges never stop and neither do the movies. 